que soy la nieta de uh, Ana María Valerio y la hija de Grace Fontanes, de Alta Gracia Fontanes. Um, bienvenido. Um, thank you for being here. This is an important and timely conversation, so thank you, um, and thank you for coming to our home. CUNY welcomes you. As a CUNY trustee, I want to tell you that nothing gives me greater pleasure than to use the CUNY facilities to open it up to community, para comunidad, para, para eso estamos presentes. Y le quiero dar la bien, la gracias este, um, a Edwin porque Para ese framework, that framework that he laid out is going to be the basis of today's conversation. Because we are a people, we have a lot of passion, we have an incredible amount of intelligence, tenemos mucha pasión, tenemos inteligencia, tenemos capacidad, y tenemos ganas. Siempre tenemos ganas. A veces nos ponemos un poquito laid back, quien más va, o criticones, somos bien criticones. Este... <laughs> Pero lo más importante es que hoy, como en el 47, necesitamos una unidad, una unidad que nunca he, hemos tenido. Y tenemos, ahora Puerto Rico no necesita a nosotros y nosotros necesitamos a Puerto Rico. Nosotros somos una patria extendida. No somos 3 millones allá y 6 millones aquí. Somos una patria extendida. Y ese concepto es el concepto que tenemos que toirto guantal cerca al corazón, pero también como la motivación para nuestra acción. That is the most important thing. E we are in, in a country that has citizens on two different locations, and we should never forget that. We are not Puerto Ricans, New York Ricans, Chicago Ricans, Philadelphia Ricans. We are Puerto Ricans, and we all come from the same place. And until we embrace that and not a let that, because language is important and our choice of words is very important. So we cannot get ourselves divided in any one of those issues. It was, and I'm not saying Florida did an incredible job, um, and people in Florida are mixed. Some people are happy that they're in Florida, some people are unhappy that they had to leave Puerto Rico. So it's not, you know, it's not just, just like in, like in New York. Some of us are very happy that we're here, some of us are sad that we're not in Puerto Rico. That, it's no different. We have a, a great affinity with our, our homeland. And that is what's so important. But more importantly, Puerto Rico needs us now, and we need Puerto Rico. And I was in an event yesterday where the mayor said, we will not let Puerto Rico go. And we have to all raise our voices. So we all have alliances and allegiances, and we need to tap onto those, because in the new world order that we have with the president that we have, and this is nonpartisan <laughs> statement, we know that Puerto Rico, <laughs> we know that Puerto Rico will become an afterthought, and we cannot allow that. We have a health crisis, and we want health parity, and we want reimbursement parity, and that will only happen if all of us really raise our voices. So it is totally appropriate to use these iconic institutions that have been established organically out of pride, out of <laughs> mission, nothing but pure pride and passion has generated these 55 organizations throughout the country, right? And, um, because we are prideful. And when you feel as if you are marginalized or disenfranchised, the way you exert that is through your culture. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the parades. And those institutions are the institutions that we can use to support the existing institutions, but we also could use them as a platform. And we could use them as a platform for key messages. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history on the Puerto Rican, uh, the National Puerto Rican Day Parade, because it gives us context. And it's the National Puerto Rican Day Parade, what we have is history. But what they have is a generation and power and new vision. It is the merging of all of that that can get us to greatness. So it's never for me about one being better than the other. One is very different, but we each have different learnings and different capacities, 
and together we make greatness, all right? So that's important. I'm going to recite the history because it's relevant for today, and you see how history has an uncanny way of repeating itself. April 13, 1958 was the first Puerto Rican Day Parade in New York. We celebrate 60 years this April. Yes. Wow. So that if you look at that in the nonprofit world, we are sort of like in late adolescence, all right? Because in the nonprofit world, most of the standard nonprofit in the United States may be anywhere between 100 and 150. So we might be in sort of like late adolescence. And some of our behavior in the past was very, very adolescent and infantile behavior, um, which, which, which caused some major changes, all right? Um, in 1995, it took from, from 58 to 95 for it to be incorporated as the, uh, a national parade. And that was the vision of one man, all right? Um, uh, Ramon Velez, and there's a, if you think Puerto Ricans have a million opinions about Puerto Rico and status and elections and politicians, people have a million opinions about Ramon Velez also. But what I can tell you about Ramon Velez is that a lot of the iconic institutions that he established still exist. And there, there's something to be said for them. Um, the parade, very early on, in, in its very early years, it was real clear that it became the, two, the place to be on Fifth Avenue that day for politicians, for educators, for any influencers. And then corporations started picking that up, which is why we're going to start going to, to to the economic side of this. But that is only a one day event. What I hope comes out of today is how we can take that energy, that power, that enthusiasm, that message, let it last for more than one day, but also let it resonate in the different parts of, of the United States, all right? Good, so I, I really uh, believe that. But for you to know something, why 58 was so important, April 58, the Puerto Rican flag prior to 1958, from 1900 to 1957, all right, was an illegal icon. It was, it was a felony, as a matter of fact, to sing a song, to have a flag of Puerto Rico. Um, and this was really an attack on a variety of things, but it was America, uh, it was dominance of the United States. The United States really wanted to be clear that the American flag was to have dominance on everything. And if you look at some of the early pictures of the first governor of Puerto Rico, uh, when the first uh, governor of Puerto Rico was established, which was not a Puerto Rican, you can see that it's all draped with American flags. Uh, so in 1948, all right, they put in a public law to basically make it a felony. And it was called the gag, the gag law. Um, I like it in said in Spanish, but of course I'll never be able to pronounce it uh, right. But um, la ley de la moldasca, moldasca. I love that, you know, sort of like you can just feel like it just took a chunk out of your heart. Um, <laughs> and so singing la boriqueña or anything like that was felony. It was really funny because in 1950, November 1950, a month after I was born, 3,000 Puerto Ricans were arrested because they displayed the flag or because they sang a song. That is unbelievable. And yet, it's so plausible, right? When you start thinking, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> right. So it took nine years to repeal that law. The law was unconstitutional, always violated the US Constitution, but that's never uh, prevented anything from occurring. Um, but it took it, 50, it took it seven years to repeal it. But the interesting part, it was repealed in November of 57, and the first Puerto Rican Day Parade, showing the flag with all of its grandeur and all of its glory is, uh, took place on April 58th, all right? That's not, a, that's not a coincidence. That was a reaction, and that was, when you, when you hold back a 
and you oppress the people, people have nothing to do but to come back and come back in grand style. So much so that that Puerto Rican Day Parade still exists today, all right? So let me give you a little bit of background. In 1913, 1923, and 2013, when, when, the, when, did the, when did the AG? The parade has had a rich history, and as I said, you know, if you look at it in terms of organizational development, from an organizational development, we would be in our late adolescence. And as a result of that, it had some tumultuous periods. And we do not have any negative opinions about it being commercial because it costs money to run a parade, as all of you who run parades know. Uh, but it's about how you do that and how is it that that comes back to serve community. Uh, and so there was, there's, there was uh, some opinions that this parade lost its way. And, um, and so much so that it violated some of New York State's nonprofit laws, to the point that the AG stepped in. And I'm gonna say that to all of you who are parade or festival organizers, stay within the parameters of the nonprofit laws. Because what they will do is clearly, if you're gonna be profit making, keep within those parameters. But if you're gonna be in the nonprofit world, make sure you follow all the tenets of the nonprofit jurisdictions and governance and regulations in your area. Because it is the easiest and the best way that they can stop you. And then they scandalize it and then they try to destroy it. In New York, they knew that that was not gonna be possible. So what they did was they reconstituted the board. And as a result of that, we have some board members here. Can you stand up? Um, the Attorney General of New York appointed, <laughs> appointed 13 people, a lot of them who had minimal experience um, organizing or had a lot of experience organizing and were business people or corporate people or educators, but who were not part of the parade. That was one of the, um, one of the um, requirements to say. And then they picked me, um, and they asked me to be the chairperson. And because I've had a, a little bit of time in this city and I've done a few things um, that helped me as an organizer and helped me with nonprofits and have run some of the finest nonprofits in this region, and I'm very proud of that. Um, but what did we do? First thing we, do, we did was go back to the history of the parade. Where did we start? What was that 1958 feeling? What was that intent? The intent was, as the incorporation papers say, to represent the assets of the Puerto Rican community, commercial, educational, in all areas, legal, um, and I forgot all of them, because uh, I don't study the bylaws every day. Um, but it basically said to represent the assets and the best of our community in all sectors. And that's what we did. The other thing that, we, that, that it had as its premise, which it lost its way greatly, was in education and scholarship. That it had established a scholarship fund. It kind of got scholarship conflated with beauty pageants and lost their way. And um, so what we went back to was to make sure that we had a very, very strong scholarship program. And I'll, when we first took over the parade, we had five scholarships. They were raising hundreds of thousands of dollars and giving out five scholarships a year. That to me as an educator, as someone who was the executive director of ASPIDA was deplorable. Um, we immediately increased that to 15. We, had, we didn't have ni un chile, we didn't have a penny. We didn't even have a location, we had nothing. We didn't even have lots of, uh, oh, we had, we had debt. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which we ignored, by the way. We said, if they didn't pay you before, don't come to me. Um, <laughs> take me to court. But, um, but what we were real clear about was that scholarship was gonna be the signature program of this parade. So it's cultural education, representing our assets in positive ways, and also um, scholarship. And then the third thing was empowerment. How is it that we could become a vehicle to uh, educate on the current issues or the past issues of our 
of, of Puerto Rico, both here as well as in our homeland, right? And that to us was like clear and key. So one of the first things we, and when we started this, we had lots of allies and a lot of people cheering us and we had just as many people, many of them Puerto Ricans trying to knock us down. Um, but you know cuando uno encabrona a una puertorriqueña. <laughs> That's what happened. You know, when some, you know, it's sort of like, tell a Puerto Rican woman that she can't. <laughs> dumb, dumb move. Um, so we had seven weeks to pull this parade off. Some of you have heard this history. And it was the miracle on Fifth Avenue. And I have to tell you, there, I have been to that parade since maybe I was eight years old. Obviously, I had to be because that's when it first started. My, that was my grandmother's, you know, as we called it the pilgrimage. You know, everybody went, the entire family. You took, you know, balde de comida and, and, um, and you just stood there all day and cheered. Um, and we still do that. Um, <laughs> it's great to see it like in three and four generations afterwards, my little, my great nieces and my grandchildren like with such pride about it. Um, but what, we, what we've done is made sure that um, all of the opinions, we said we were going to be un pueblo, which is what we are, con muchas voces. Because we didn't want to really drown out any opinion. Regardless of how irritating that opinion might have been to us personally, um, <laughs> We didn't want to drown it out because that's what people have been doing to us all the time. You know, if I believe this, then I exclude you. And if I believe that, then I exclude you. We've been marginalized, so our commitment was to marginalize nobody. We paid a great price for that because we had all sides arguing with us about what we should have been doing and we could have been because, you know, we don't have much opinion. And what we did was we encouraged people. We had, when we did the Borinqueneers, which I never believed in my life, that anyone could dissent about that. And we had some Republican Puerto Ricans, you know, like chastising us because of our position on the Borinqueneers. And it was, it was an incredible learning experience. So un, una vo un pueblo muchas voces. That to us is I would encourage all of you who have festivals, if you start doing that, you can become a little more inclusive. Now, if your agenda is really a progressive you know, agenda, then don't, don't do that. But if, if, it's, if it's more of a galvanizing thing, consider that. The other thing that we, we did was we have a cultural committee. So we have a theme, a cultural theme that we honor. Um, so last year it was LGBT. The parade never excluded the gay, lesbian, and transgender community, but the parade never honored. So it was silent. And so we said, no, we're not going to be silent about any part of our community. We were very robust about Oscar, and we still are. And we say that our parade will always be dedicated to Oscar. So that is education and Oscar are the constants. So you can always look at those in our parade. The other thing that was really important um, for us was being thematic because then the honorees, then all of the events and everything then had a particular flavor. And it was a particular part of our community that we may not have in the past honored. We did the Afro Boricua. It was amazing to us how that was so unrecognized in so many arenas for so long. And the talent and the brilliance that we have, that we were able to expose and, um, and um, promote. So that gives you a flavor about where we are. We are unflinching in terms of un pueblo muchas voces. And that's, that is sort of like a leadership role that we take. We say, give us the information. We'll post all of the information. And we will be an, a source of education for our community. Um, Try, try the best of our abilities to be unfiltered. You know, there's some uh, positions we will not take also. We also are principal, you know, so like if somebody's talking about genocide or, you know, something about who we are, 
we also um, have the right to not post, all right, and not to acknowledge. Because it has to be about the assets and the positive aspects of that. There's lots of other people that can tell me about my crime rates and my high number of young people in prison and all of that. That's not our role. Our role is to talk about the remedies for that and the positive actions that our community is taking against that. Then the other thing that we have is, so it's thematic, it's culture, it's education. I'm very, very pleased to say that we now have scholarship fund where we, we um, this is our first year, because we made a commitment uh, to give out 100 scholarships. So, and those scholarships, which is also important for you to know, especially those of you from, from the other parts of the diaspora, it's really important. Every Puerto Rican, every young person of Puerto Rican heritage is eligible to apply for ours. This is not New York. So I want people from Chicago, I want people from Philly, I want people from Orlando, I want people, yeah, no, really. Um, and, we, and we have applications today, scholarship applications and the website to show you where you can get it because our commitment is to grow that to 200 and make that the fund, that every year we do 200. I just made two people faint in the front here. Um, <laughs> and we oh, definitely take donations. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you a T-shirt. Do you know a young man called Lynn Manuel Miranda? Oh yeah. Yeah, this young, this young uh, McCarthy genius, Tony Award winning, Grammy Award winning. The only thing he hasn't won is an Oscar. Young man is is has aligned himself with the Puerto Rican uh, National Puerto Rican Scholarship Fund. He has designed a t-shirt for us and with us, and that t-shirt is on sale, and the proceeds of that t-shirt will support the scholarship fund. I'll show you an example. So anybody who wants to, I'll give you the website later on where you could go. Just remember that every time you buy one of those t-shirts, you're also buying a scholarship for someone in your neighborhood, in your community. And I just want to be very, very clear about that. Um, so that, that's us, and I'm so pleased that there are other people in, of parades here so that we can start today the conversation of who we each are, how do we stand in all of the strength and power that we have in our own region, but how is it that we mobilize together and um, become a force, not just a one day wonder, but a force because the beauty is that we will all take place at different times and we can support and promote each other's activities. The last thing I wanna tell you about us is we made a decision that um, we were gonna grow this parade um, and, um, and I made a commitment that this is about leadership development so that all of these young people, this I will not be the president forever, I will not be the president for long as I look at them. Um, because I really do believe, I come from Aspira, and Aspira is about, about leadership development. And so that if I become the iconic institution, then there is no iconic institution. The iconic institution is the parade, not Lorraine Colte Vasquez. And, um, and so these young people and these young emerging leaders are the ones that will take over this parade, just like I see all of you in the audience, you're taking over your parades, and that's what it's about, right? Uh, it's about the transfer of power, and it's also about um, development, and I will always be an ally and a supporter, just like I always am an ally supporter for the Federation and, um, and, um, and, uh, and Aspida. But we take place in June. We have these other institutions, because I, I would love to, to um, have Nilda and, I guess me, Fernando. Javier. 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 Javier uh, talk about the distinctions in their parades, because one is a, is a commercial parade. And I don't say that disparagingly, I say that with great pride. Um, because we have a partnership with WABC, WABC, um, and now they're gonna be airing our parade in Orlando. Uh, they did last year and will continue to do that, which has just totally was a game changer for us. We went from a very small local network to a much larger network, and they pay to be part of this parade, which is very different than any other media partner we've had in the past. Um, but because it takes money to, 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 to run a parade, um, you need 
a commercial aspect to it. So I would like uh, Javier to talk about that because it's a, it's, it's a similarity and yet it's a contrast. And how he has, I mean, talking about sitting in the birds, you know, the birdhouse seat or whatever the uh, phrase is, you're in a phenomenal position because you are Orlando. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank Javier, you. welcome, and thank you for coming to our city in this wonderful, warm day. Thank you. <laughs> Fiesta San Sebastián, that's our ah, festival ah. in Orlando, Sunset. As the Puerto Rican community continues to grow in Orlando, thus the collective desire of the population to remain connected to the island and their traditions. Puerto Rico is said to have the longest Christmas season in the world. <laughs> And La Fiesta de la Calle San Sebastián, <laughs> or La Sanse for the short, is our annual festivity celebrated in Old San Juan, Puerto Rico marked the culmination. Our goal with the Sanse Orlando is to take the Puerto Ricans in the area of Central Florida on a stroll down of their memories of the, his traditional festivals and make them feel like right at home. What are our challenges? We need to stay true to a cultural event and unite Puerto Ricans residing outside the island. To obtain sponsorship from national brands in order to maintain sustainability and earn the respect and the support from the government to continue building every year this event. We got some opportunities and one that we've been working with them is to introduce to Florida market Puerto Rican businesses by providing them a platform to expose, launch, and sample their product and services. We have products that have been with us and they have opened the market in Orlando and they still, and there's still more to come for next year. I got like four more brands coming up. I don't wanna mention because I don't pay now. <laughs> <laughs> One of the opportunities that I want with this conference is to create workshops to offer conference says, towards the development of artesanos and the world to educate Puerto Rican folklore music. We want to span our vision and bring the festival to other Puerto Rican communities in Central Florida and the United States. Uh, basically, Puerto Rico is well known as the happiest people in planet Earth. We are. If you go to the island, there's a festival, there's a parade. <laughs> in every corner, Festival del Plátano, <laughs> El Festival de la Morcilla. <laughs> and now it's very common to say, El Chinchorreo. <laughs> Vamos a chinchorear. But it's our commitment as parades and festival organizers to bring the events always thinking about the, our culture and the heritage that we carry. And I would like to finish with this a phrase. It says, you can leave the island, but the island never leaves you. And that's what you carry with you everywhere you go. Thank you. No, that, that's interesting. Okay. I wasn't, oops. Okay. That's interesting because I wasn't born in the island, but I love it. <laughs> and I have property there and I'm Boricua 100%. Este, it was interesting listening to you talk and thank you for putting this together, um, Edwin. And I just loved hearing everything you had to say, este, um, Lorraine. And what was interesting about talking about the Puerto Rican woman being so upset, I am on the, I am on the, um, I was on the board of the National Council of La Raza for a long time, and I worked for them for a really long time. And um, Asociación Puerto Ricanos de Macha started back in the 60s, and they incorporated in the 70s. And um, I, I have been working. I have a 28-year history there, even though that I've been the, the CEO for the last 12 years. Um, so in 2005, I, I, um, I made the shortlist. And anyway, the rest is history. Here I am. But um, <laughs> NCLR was having their conference in Philadelphia. And we had uh, someone on their board that um, they always leave something in Philadelphia. So they went to South Philly because we have a huge Mexican uh, community growing. 
So I'm sitting there thinking, que? Yeah. I mean, it's okay that you do that. I mean, absolutely, you have to, but where's the Puerto Rican um, acknowledgement? Where's the Puerto Rican community? And there was none, absolutely none. And I'm like, are you kidding me? We have such a long history from way back in the 40s that the sugar cane and, um, and the workers would come to Philadelphia from Puerto Rico. So um, none. So. I had just been in my position three months, <laughs> and I'm like, what do I do about this? So I came up with this idea. My grandfather used to grow uh, sugar cane in San Sebastian, and I said, well, we have a Puerto Rican parade, <laughs> um, which we're going to hear uh, later more about. But I said, how do, so I put this, I just thought, okay, el festival de la caña, that's what we'll do. <laughs> and, that, and in three months, we put this thing together, and uh, we, had, we had artists, we had music, and we invited all of um, NCLR. They had buses come out to our site. And I, I, I made them come to our community. We did not go down there. We had them come to the community and get to meet the Puerto Rican people in Philadelphia. That, I mean, as Latinos and Puerto Ricans, we always get ignored and invisible. Um, the strongest institutions in Philadelphia, nonprofits, are Puerto Rican. You have, you have, um, yeah, you have Nueva Esperanza, which Philadelphia Magazine just did an article about the Rev and, and all that he's done. And one of the, the questions they asked him is, how is it that people don't know about you? And I'm like, had it been a white man doing what he does, he has been with every single president, he has um, prayed at their, and they would have been celebrated, but you know, he's not, He's not from the right side of the tracks. <laughs> Pero anyway, so they did that. Um, AP, you know, we have Aspira, we have Concilio, ACE, huge, huge assets. APM, I mean, our budget is $42 million, and we have 300 on staff, and we have over $100 million in assets. And if any other developer did what we did, you would have the doors knocking. We don't. We have to work so hard for every little thing that we do. And we were the first ones in the country to have the uh, Platinum Lead neighborhood development. And I just get astounded every time that I think, and it's not a lack of publicity because we get out there, but it just is what it is. So anyway, that's how it started. And you know, you having- know what, I'm gonna stop you. Okay. Because that's the way it was. And it doesn't have to be that way. Because there's you, there's him, there's me, there's everybody in this room. And what we don't do that other communities do is promote each other and buy from each other and invest in each other. So I, 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 I couldn't, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to but that's what today should be about. How is it that we cross fertilize? How is that we promote? You know, we're going to learn from Javier about making sure that we're a platform so our businesses can get the exposure, but then we expect something back from those businesses. That's what today's conversation is about. And you are too big for that to, to, to continue to happen to you. Yeah, you know, I, 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 before I die, we will no longer be a marginalized person. So thank I mean, you. People, I'm, because, I'm right with you, you man. Know, it's like, I'm bringing you the feeling. We, you are you know, it's, it's, <laughs> you know, that We've lived in that invisible space. And as big as I am, I, there's no way I could be invisible. You know? <laughs> I agree. I mean, it, it, it hurt. You know, I, I was born in 1961. I'm aging myself. But I remember, you know, today it's kind of cool to be Latino, right? It wasn't when I was growing up. I mean, the names they used to call us and, and the things they used to say. And I remember I would go to the shore and I wasn't allowed to speak Spanish because they said that the people there did not like Puerto Ricans. And oh, it used to piss me off. And the other day I had a friend that was telling me that when she met me, that I was a little jibarita because I would always speak Spanish. But I don't know, I grew up in Philadelphia always speaking Spanish because you know we all congregate with each other, right? So mommy came to work in a factory and it was always around a Puerto Rican community. She never really learned much English because we all huddle around each other, right? So when I started school, I didn't know any English. So, um, but then, because of that, it just made me more angry, and then I wanted to speak Spanish more. It wasn't because I couldn't, I didn't want to. And if you spoke Spanish, I was gonna to talk to you in Spanish, unless I was forced to speak English. So it was, it's that Puerto Rican pride that you bring with you, even though that you're born here. So anyway, that's how we started the, 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 Puerto, the um, Festival de la Caña. 
it got so much, the Puerto Ricans were so happy about it. It was in the community. We had a lot of people. And when we got done, the staff came up to me and said, um, is this going to be the last year or are we going to continue it? Because so many people were there and want to take it. And I said, really? So we, we, started, we, we started out every year doing that. Today, we have, a, um, 12 years later, uh, we have 6,000 people that come to the, to, to the uh, Festival de la Caña. It's become the opening of the summer. Um, we always have it on the second Saturday of June. And, um, and the big challenge, like, like what you said, it's about keeping our culture and you know, with the name Asociación Puerto Riqueños de Mancha, people get amazed that we have grown as big as we have with that name. And we are in an area that is very diverse and half is African American. Um, and when I started APM, when I, when I started at APM, one of the big questions that I put to the board as well is, do we continue to be a Puerto Rican agency or do we serve everyone? And this, by the way, these conversations were over a year and a half. But at the end of the day, this is what they said to me. We want to serve the poor. If the Puerto Ricans that are doing well and don't need us, we don't need to keep running after them. They can take care of themselves. But we want to make sure that we serve the, the, the poor and the disenfranchised. But you, the name is um, not negotiable. I don't yeah. care what you do, but the name is not negotiable. So I... Um, so we, we worked around it, and um, you know the challenge is always how do you keep the culture and, and who we are. And it's important. You know We had a Puerto Rican uh, person run for mayor of Philadelphia. And um, I, he's been a great mentor to me, at the, um, Judge Nelson Diaz, which many of you probably know. So um, I was, I, it's the first time I've come out of my comfort zone and actually helped in a campaign, which was very interesting. But um, I remember one day, my husband, it's Friday night, he's hanging out with his brothers, and um, all these guys are getting ready to go play dominoes and go downstairs and do. So I said to them, mira, before you all go, um, we have a Puerto Rican running for mayor. What? You have a what? And I, we had to get a 1,000 signatures. And I remember giving it to them. And I said, let me go get you the pamphlet. By the time I came back, all of them had signed the sheet. And I go, guys, you don't even know what he stands for. Man, we need a Puerto Rican. The mere fact that he was Puerto Rican, all these guys signed up. It was very interesting for me, that Puerto Rican pride that we hold in just you know, um, validating and, and saying, hey, look at me. I'm, I'm important. I'm here. I belong. And, um, and I, I agree with you. We, we should not allow ourselves to get uh, marginalized. And that's why I love you know, this festival. We've been looking to grow it um, and have more. I learned so much today from listening to you and the history. Um, I know some of the history, but unfortunately, you hear the gossip more than you hear you know, the good stuff, right? <laughs> so I've heard of the parade, the marches, and all. So um, I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to learning from everyone. How you commercialize it, I don't know. It doesn't lose money, but we don't make a lot of money. But what I will say is that I always tell people we vote in two ways. We go and we do our polls and we vote. But we also vote with our money. And I think it's really important for us um, to vote with our money. So if it's an institution that you believe in more than ever, you need to support that and support our businesses, support them. And um, one of the things that I did, and I, I'm, I'm going to try not to get political, but I looked at who what vendors and who supported the people I didn't want to because of their very clear racist, and I just stopped, I, I just stopped my contracts. Some of my contracts are million dollar contracts with them, and personally, my own, um, I just stopped. I'm, that's the way we vote. Yeah, that, and I think Javier, Javier has just has got me intrigued because of this giving our businesses a platform, you know, and exposing them in a way that they would not normally be able to have the reach, right? And what you just talked about, Nilda, was real principal leadership. If you don't represent me, then you can't represent me and you can't have my money, all right? And so we do a, we do a very similar thing about, we do a canvas of which of the companies have taken a position or not a position against or for Puerto Rico uh, or Puerto Ricans, and, and we do that kind of canvas because you know, some people say any money, anybody's money is good, and I'm saying, no, anybody's money is not good. I'm not giving you an opportunity or, an, or, an, uh, or, um, or, or a, a, a promotional opportunity. 
What I would like us to do now is to take some questions because I think you have three very different models up here um, and, and, um, and to take some questions about how is it that we could form, you know, take questions, but I also want the conversation to be how is it that we can build on each other's educational platform and be a, um, vehicles for each other to, to, a lance, um, to launch a larger agenda. Yes, Edwin. As an innocent as opposed to a non-innocent? <laughs> <laughs> or a guilty question? Uh, typically, they will be not innocent. So this is an innocent question. So I have a lot of friends in Puerto Rico who are in the Chamber of Commerce and so forth, and they really want to come to this market. This is people in Puerto Rico, precisely to introduce this and that. There are delegations coming. So my question is, they can play a catalytic, catalytic role with our own parades. You know, if we were to have circuits, for example, there's an idea that Is it a question or are you making a statement? <laughs> can you, it's a question now. That was the preamble. I thought I had some rights here, but anyway. So the question is. Not when I'm the moderator. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You should all know that she's my boss. And uh, she's a trustee. Literally. <laughs> so the question is, do you think that we can think about a, a sort of a, a national network trade thing that will encompass all of us here and people in Puerto Rico rotate the thing, bring the vendors? I mean, something like that. So, so, all right. And so I'm going to respond and I'm going to have Javier respond. My thing, and I, this is my old Aspida hat. Don't build new institutions, build upon and work with the institutions that we have, all right? Because we're always reinventing something. You have the opportunity, any business who wants to do business, there are a variety of ways, and I can tell you for New York, and Javier's gonna definitely tell you for Orlando. You can't get two better markets than Orlando, Philly. The only one missing here is Connecticut, all right? So the, those are the, uh, and there she goes, all right? So these are the largest <laughs> markets if you want to reach Puerto Ricans, all right, um, in Chicago. Um, the one, anybody who wants to introduce their wares in this market, in this, this DMA, the larger, greater New York market, they would have to advertise during the parade on ABC. They would have to participate in the parade. That's, you know, that's, that's, a, that's they, instantly they get access to almost six million people. Puerto Ricans and all of their affiliates, right? And I'm sure Javier can answer ways that they can do it. Well, the, the way that we can help Puerto Rico is consumiendo lo que se hace en el país. Exactly. Yeah. You know, that way we can help them. And if they're here. And they're, they're knowing, you know, Orlando is being growing and El Mesón is opening like in four different places. And if you go to that place, the lines are out of the hook, you know? Because <laughs> they want, They're good, you know, and- Buy stocking and miss something. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of companies coming up, you know, Productos Titan, they're, they did like a merge with a lot of small products coming out instead of spending, bringing one container from the island, each one, of them, they, they don't have budget for that, so they put together like one container, they bring all the products inside, and the way they, they are growing. And now they can bring their own containers to right. sell the products in Puerto Rico. So that's the way we, we see it. He shows a slide or be earlier about the, the Puerto Rican power in, in, per, power in purchasing. But we need to teach our national brands that we are empowered to buy their products too. And they need to sponsor us. And right. we need their money. Right, right. You know, and that's, and all of you who are in business or any way that you work, that's one of the first questions you may ask. Have you supported the Puerto Rican community? How is it that you support the Puerto Rican community? Mm -hmm. It's a simple question. It's one of those innocent questions, as Edward would call it. <laughs> um, just response, you, you an know, innocent response. I mean, it, it, we had a study on the Jewish community and a dollar gets circulated in the Jewish community seven times before it goes out. Of wow. that well, and if you wanted, there's one community that trumps that. No pun intended with that okay. word. <laughs> there's, there's one community that usurps that. 
And that is the Mormon community. The Mormon community money stays within the Mormon community. And then they take your money in through Abercrombie and Finch and a lot of the development corporations, but their money stays within their own supplier network. And in the community, in the Puerto Rican community, once. It's yeah. Yeah. So, and Puerto Rico, I mean, I, I want to build on what Javier said and then we'll go back to the questions. <clears throat> Javier talked about the best way we can help Puerto Rico is by buying its products. Right now, there's an incredible movement of made in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the small businesses, and if you look at El Mercado and all of those other little places that are just, you know, all of these small businesses coming, that's going to be Puerto Rico's salvation. You're absolutely right. And we mm -hmm. need to start buying those products and promoting them. Next question. Hi. Hi, Lorraine. Buenas Hi. tardes. Buenas tardes. Bienvenido al barrio. Welcome Thank to you. the neighborhood. Mi first time Felix. in the barrio. This is the first time? In the barrio. Que no sea really? la última. No. Que no sea la última. I've que been no eating for última. one day a lot of Puerican food. <laughs> <laughs> Cuchifrito. Cuchifrito. You gotta go there. You gotta like go there. La capurria. That chacho. Um, uh, my name is Felix Leo Campos. I'm from After Dark, Cat V Pro, and uh, La Fortaleza Project. No, to speak about supporting um, uh, Puerto Rican uh, uh, businesses and, and culture. Uh, has there been any consideration to using Puerto Rican arts and culture as a vehicle for economic development, which is what we're doing with La Fortaleza Project? But secondly, I think this is something that uh, I don't know if this is within the scope of what this particular uh, conference is about. But how do we maintain our communities, the, identity, the history and identity of the communities, its businesses, and more importantly, the cultural institutions that we create that somehow uh, are being uh, taken away from us through any one of a number of means, gentrification and political aspirations being among them. Yeah, the, the way we promote it is we're always in alliance and form collaborations with the cultural institutions, and we continue to do that. Um, but you know, it's 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 one of the one of the challenges in, in our community, as with the all the our community as a whole. The art community as a whole for, La, for Puerto Rican La, Latino artists are really struggling. Puerto Rican artists are struggling even further. But our commitment is to constantly have an alliance with and build. Use, you, we only do Puerto Rican art. We will only have Puerto Rican artists perform. And so that to us is, is key. Um, we, we really don't. We would not you know, be promoting anybody else's art. In, in my case, um, Las Fiestas Sebastián is very cultural, and we don't charge to any artesano. And this, for next year, I already got 80 people from the island, artesanos from, Bur from Puerto Rico coming down to, to the festival. And that's, that's huge, you know, because they sold everything items on the first day. That's wow. You know. That's a great idea, Javier. I don't think we've done that. That's a great idea. And we, you know, we, do you underwrite them or do they? Well, no, no, that's a question. mouth to mouth promotion. Okay, so so all right, but that's that's another way. Well, they also that. say you know, every food has to be Puerto Rican. Yeah. At the festival, every person that we employ is has to be Puerto Rican because we have to support each other. You know. You, I'm so glad you said that because we have been in our own small way. You know, right now the float companies in New York are, are um, there's a monopoly. monopoly. It, wow. And so, you know, and, and he's, uh, now he's ethical and generous. I don't know that he always was that. But, uh, but, what we've done is that we also have two or three small float guys that are Puerto Rican. And every, and we even have Positive Workforce, which also has one or two floats. And what we've done is encourage them and first buy from them the floats so that then they could have the money to generate and buy more floats. And they know, we can't say that explicitly, but if to the extent that they grow, they will be our market share. They will have our market share. And, uh, and we've been doing that very deliberately to encourage them 
to grow and uh, move forward. So you're absolutely right. But thank you for the idea of the Altesanos from Puerto Rico. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. that's the key point on the event. Any other questions? So along with the statement, um, my name is Melissa Del Valle Ortiz. Um, I was formerly involved with a lot of different organizations. And um, one of the things I want to lend to everybody here is through my involvement of all those organizations, I found that the leadership within those organizations has been very tight and that the leadership refuses to let go. Not let go, just loosen up a little. Invite our youth around the table. Bring them to these events because they are the next generation. My kids here that are living here that been to Puerto Rico because as a single mom, I had to cut corners, blah, 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 all that stuff, just so I could bring them so that they could know La Isla, so that they could have a taste of what it really, really is, and it's not the cuchifrito on the corner. Um, and all of that being said, and I'm fighting back tears, all of that being said, I need the leadership in this room to ensure and commit to engaging the next generation and bringing them around that leadership table and teaching them their history and teaching them their culture and keeping them active in their community, in their schools, engaging them absolutely in, the next, in, in college and secondary school and all of those things. But please, I, I implore you, bring them around the leadership table because we're losing, we have already lost our language. We're losing our culture and our identity here in the United States. I just got involved with the Boricua Festival in um, Sunset Park in Brooklyn with Pat Ruiz. 20 years, she's been doing this volunteer, volunteer, not paid, all on her own with a small group of people. And it is an amazing thing to see every year come together. But again, that, I mean, my, not necessarily just a question, but more on a statement. How does the Puerto Rican parade, because everybody knows the Puerto Rican they parade, lend that message across the United States to say, hey, we need to engage our youth. And it's so, not just about singing and dancing. So we do it three ways, all right? Um, the first way is to celebrate with them with their music and their dancing. So, go. all right? Yeah. Um, and and the, the first way that we do it is by emulating, modeling the behavior we expect. So we have a board that rotates. Our board gets paid a lot of money. <laughs> our, board, <laughs> our board gets paid uh, with lots of love and hugs and kisses, and we, we, we bribe each other with food. Um, we are the most, as somebody said, I've never been such hardworking, non-paid people in my life. <laughs> um, between April, you know, really between March and June, we dedicate almost 80% of our personal and professional time to this parade. Um, we get, do not get paid. How is it that we bring it? Our scholarship program is not just a scholarship, which is important for all of you to recognize. In addition to our scholarship, we give a class. First of all, one of the questions on the essay is what is it, you know, how you're, um, okay. Um, one of the questions on the essay is, what is it that you're doing for your community? Because for us, it's about paying it forward, and they have to have, you know, that's the Aspira way, right? You've got to give something back. The other piece, the, way, the other way that we do it with bringing our young people in is making sure that they participate in a class that we give on Puerto Rican culture, all right? You just give them a background. Uh, most of them, like you said, only think about it in food, or I know the coqui, and you know what, I'll take it. If that's your center and your, your source of pride, I'll take that. And then we try to build on that knowledge base, right? And then the third way that we do that, we also do it, is that we give part of, of not only the class, we also give an enrichment day, you know, which is a dress for success and how to interview, and among their own colleagues, and how they can build a, a a support team amongst themselves. So we try to build that network, a core network within the scholars of that particular class among themselves. That's, you know, it's all the good old Aspira stuff that never leaves you and you keep doing over and over again. Um, 
Uh, one more question, yes. and then they, they just gonna give us the hook. Speaking of scholarships, I'm Andres Jorge Adams, retired clinical assistant professor of psychiatry, College of Medicine, SUNY Downstate Medical Center. The scholarships that you spoke about, um, are these scholarships also directed to try to get more Puerto Rican women into medicine, specifically in the area of geriatrics and gerontology, which unfortunately is among the lowest paid areas in healthcare, considering that our Puerto Rican community is getting older and older, which of course makes us more vulnerable to such chronic illnesses such as diabetes, high blood pressure, which are also antecedents to um, dementia of the Alzheimer's type. So the answer to your question is no. Um, we do not target the scholarships. What, we, what our scholarship program is, um, is to promote higher education and to uh, ensure some financial security so that they can continue in school. We have a scholarship program. 60% of our scholarships go to entering um, freshmen, entering freshmen, and the other 40% are for young people in college already up to the second year of college because we want to make sure that they can support and finish school. So no, we don't target. We're not large enough, nor do we have the resources to do that kind of targeting. I wish we could. Is there a viaduct from, say, uh, the undergraduate level or the community college level into medical school, like specifically for more Puerto Rican women? So what we are doing this year is that we're going to forge a partnership with the Hispanic Scholarship Fund to see if we can start creating those viaducts. And we're also looking at with the Hispanic Medical Association okay. to see if we can do those kind of viaducts also. But we don't have the resources nor the capacity to do that kind of targeting. I wish we did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. That's all we have time for right now. Please save your questions. We have a couple of networking events that are coming later, and you can ask our guests and, and uh, ask your questions then. Um, thank you so much. Let's give a very um, a good round of applause for our opening plenary panel. Um, I have my commercial. I have, just for those of you who run parades, I bought sample programs, not for for you to participate, although you're more than welcome to come and join us, but for you to use it as, as, as mechanisms for you, okay, materials for you. We also bought the sample applications um, for the scholarship fund, and we have the website. And later on, hopefully, if I can get up town in time, I can bring a few t-shirts. But um, I want you to seriously, seriously encourage people from your area, young people from your area. Remember, high school seniors, as well as first, uh, freshmen and, and sophomores in college could apply, all right? We want them from all over the United States. Thank you very much. Mil gracias.